Welcome, everybody, and welcome to everybody who is here um, from home as well. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing to you um, Barbara Roberts, um, who is going to talk today um, about nutrition and maintaining weight with Huntington's disease. Barbara is with the University of Alabama Clinic, and um, she's got some really great information, and we'll have um, question and answer at the end. And as Louise mentioned, um, you can put those questions right into the app, and then we'll have access to them at the end of our session today. So thank you. Welcome, Barbara. Thank you. All right. So um, thank you all for allowing me to be here. Um, again, my name is Barbara Roberts. I'm a registered dietitian, and my credentials there I put on the screen are just um, I have a Master of Science in Health Education, and then I'm a registered and licensed dietitian in the state of Alabama. And the CDCES is a um, diabetes certification. I work predominantly with diabetes. It's more common, but I do work with our Huntington's patients. Um, with our UAB Center of Excellence, Dr. S Dr. Victor Sung, we heard this morning, um, is, our, is our clinic director. And then Dr. D Marissa Dean is our um, associate clinic, clinic director, or co-director, excuse me, of our Center of Excellence. So UAB, um, those of y'all that come from far away, UAB is um, University of Alabama at Birmingham. So the Roll Tide campus is not part of us. They're actually about an hour from us. So some of my friends in other states ask, you know, how, if we're related to that. We're still part of the same university system, but different. But any, that's irrelevant. <laughs> so sorry about that. Um, and then this is just the HDSA to um, this say in the talk is information, just general information too. If you have specific um, questions, you know, or specific things that have been told that are different from what I've told you, of course, follow your, your own provider's information. Um, I have no conflicts to disclose. So today we're gonna talk about kind of what to eat and what to limit. As a nutrition professional, we try not to say, you know, hard, fast rules. So don't eat X, do eat Y. You know, just try to limit those things. We'll talk about some things to limit too. Um, we'll talk about goals for meal time, um, dealing with some medication side effects that sometimes occur, um, sometimes from the HD meds, but also potentially from others, and then talk about supplements, both Insure Boost type supplements, but also vitamin mineral supplements and things like that too. And then um, it, we've got an audience here and then the audience online. If you have questions, submit those and we'll get to those at the end too. So nutrition goals. So <clears throat> what, I've, what I've learned in my um, up to, I guess, about three or four years working with the HD population, um, being a little bit overweight kind of in the early to mid stages is good. So, um, you know, if you're a little on the thin side and you've just found out you've, you're, you carry or you have um, manifest HD, as they say, the goal is to probably try to gain a little bit of weight to allow for the chorea that kind of comes with, with a condition. And then preventing weight loss, unless you've been told otherwise too. Um, a lot, we have, do have some patients that are overweight that do need to lose a few pounds too. So, some, so that's why it's so important to kind of have, have that individualized care too. Limit stimulants. Does anybody know what I mean by stimulants? What? Caffeine, yeah, caffeine, alcohol, tobacco. Um, many of our patients um, drink, I don't know if it's Alabama, it's because it's Alabama or what, but drink a lot of Mountain Dew and um, energy drinks. And those kinds of things um, have a lot of caffeine and other compounds in them that, can, that do stimulate. There is some data showing those could be potentially um, not very harmful, but not good for the HD. So, um, so I usually say, you know, one or two sodas, coffee, tea a day, but don't drink two or three pots of coffee over the course of the day, too. Um, and then, of course, as we all, many of us know, um, don't cut caffeine drastically. Cut it out gradually to prevent those headaches that sometimes occur with that. Um, choose calorie and nutrient-dense foods, and we're going to talk about what those two terms mean. And then pleasure from eating. 
So with Dr. Sung's talk today, you know, he talks, you know, every, every session, every, uh, you're not gonna go hungry at this conference, basically. So we do all get pleasure from eating. Last night's reception, there was food there. If you think of the things we all do as a society, we do together, a lot of it is eating. So we get pleasure from eating. We get together with others to eat. So we want eating to be a pleasurable activity, um, event, try to as much as possible with the HD patients to just to allow them to still try to enjoy that as much as, as, much as the individuals without HD. Um, have a balanced diet with antioxidants from foods, and we'll talk about that too. And then just um, to, to kind of prepare you, there are no, no particular supplements that do show benefit. Um, we're going to go into that a little more, but just to kind of tell you that too. Actually, somebody's trying to get in. <laughs> and then so meal time. So um, if the Korea's um, not so bad, finger foods would be recommended. So um, we're, I'm going to wait a couple of minutes and let, wow, we've got many people coming in. So thank you all for coming. All right. <laughs> okay. So finger foods. Um, so for meal time, those of y'all that were coming in, again, just to stress, um, eating and meal time is something we most of us get pleasure from. That's that's just a societal kind of a human nature thing too. Whenever you think about going to a party, you th one of the first things you think of is, what are, what are they going to have to eat? Oh, the food's going to be good. I'm going to really try to go to that party to see my friends plus to, to see the good food or try the good food, that kind of thing. So, um, so as the Korea progresses, we want to what, have what's called finger foods. So the, here's some examples. Again, while honoring the person's um, food preferences, too. So, so think of broccoli. You can kind of pick up two, um, green beans, you know, fresh or canned green beans, probably not the French style green beans because those are harder to pick up. Um, cooked carrots, so cooked baby carrots or whole carrots that are cooked. Um, raw carrots are of course are a little harder, can be a choking hazard too. Um, sweet potato slices, you know, you can slice sweet potatoes or baked potatoes, um, baked potato wedges, with sauces, Brussels sprouts are very trendy now, but you could cook those, those little baby cabbages and kind of pick them up too. Cherry tomatoes, bell peppers. Um, thinking last night, um, those of y'all that are virtual weren't here, but last night they had really good food, of course, as we were just talking, but they had um, slices of yellow squash and eggplant and portobello mushrooms too that you know, you could use with fork with, but you could also pick it up and eat too if, if using a fork is more difficult. And just think of softer fruits, banana, um, orange wedges, but also mandarin oranges, um, apple slices, maybe need to be cut up, pe soft pears, um, berries, melon wedges, like watermelons in season now is pretty soft. You could cut that in a wedge and the person could kind of bite off the pieces of that too. Um, applesauce or even applesauce um, packets now they make, we're going to talk about too. And again, um, my, the speech therapist we have at our clinic, um, her, Dr. Karen Thatcher, I don't think, I think she's listening virtually, but I work really closely with Karen um, and we try to go in and see, visit the patients together. So softer foods is oftentimes an issue too with, with swallowing issues and, you, you know, of course, honor those, those conditions too. And then distraction-free meals. So this is a thing a lot of us need to do. <laughs> um, I told you all, I, I work predominantly with diabetes. A lot of individuals with diabetes need to lose weight. Kind of, so kind of the opposite. But distraction-free meals. I hear Karen, our speech therapist, telling patients with HD that a lot too. So that you can concentrate on chewing your foods and eating slower too. A lot of times... Um, I hear the HD patients say they're always the last one to eat. So if we can all slow down, kind of it'll help and feel, make that person with HD feel a little more included, not like, okay, everybody's waiting on me again kind of thing. So if, you know, distraction-free meals. So eat, just eat when you eat. No TV, no computer, no loud music. 
there's actually data showing that when you listen to loud music while you're eating, or not loud, but fast-paced music while you're eating, you tend to eat faster. So if you go in a restaurant, you'll, ne you'll never hear elevator music because it's slow. You're going to hear really fast, high-pitched, and it, they say it actually makes you eat faster so they can use your table faster <laughs> and get the next customer in. So, but no TV. Ideally, you know, if you're going to listen to music, make it classical, something a little bit slower. No internet, too. And then... Um, and then everybody, again, try to eat slower, too. Um, I hear the, um, our speech therapists tell patients, make sure and take a sip after every bite is important, too. So maybe we, we all could benefit from that. Um, put your fork down between each bite, okay? And then, um, and sometimes between meal snacks, too. We're going to talk about some other things in a minute, too. Oh, excuse me. So equipment, um, pasta bowl. So um, I wasn't sure what that was when I first heard that, but that's a, like a plate, but it's got a higher lip on the side. So for an individual with HD that's trying to scoop up peas or something, um, rather than have them risk going into your lap, a pasta bowl, you can kind of push them over to the side and stab them with a fork or something, th things like that too. A cup with a lid too. Um, a lot of water bottles now have that, but, but, and then if you use a straw, I hear Karen tell the patients, push the straw a little further. I think it's further back in your mouth, too. Um, work with occupational therapy to get the equipment that you need. Um, and then unbreakable items, those so melamine or plastic plates, disposable plates, things like that, too. Um, not only for the risk of falling and breaking the plates, but also if a plate breaks, it's a, it's a hazard. You run the risk of, of hurting yourself, cutting yourself, that kind of thing, too. And then, um, you know, keep your hot stuff hot. Again, if, if the person with HD is eating slower, their, their food is going to get cold if it's supposed to be hot as the meal goes on. So if you can kind of try to get some kind of warmer item, um, you know, again, being careful not make, to make sure the person doesn't burn themselves while eating. But a lot of times in hospitals, if you've ever, ever been in a hospital, they have those heated plates, too. Sometimes those are expensive, but maybe you can get order something online to get something that kind of heats the plate a little bit longer. And the same thing with cold stuff, too. If it's a cold meal... Um, put the put the plate in the freezer or the refrigerator beforehand to keep it a little cooler. Those are things I don't know if y'all have noticed. They do that in restaurants. When you get a salad at a restaurant, the plate is cold too. I don't know if y'all have ever noticed that. It is a chilled plate to allow it to stay cold a little bit longer too. And so the the concept of calorie dense versus nutrient dense. Has anybody ever heard those concepts? Oh, okay, several of you. Okay, okay, good. Those are terms we use in the nutrition field a lot, and I, I, I don't think many people know what, know what we mean by that. But calorie dense is, is things that have a lot of calories and a small amount. So for somebody with, with chorea that's losing weight, I want them to have um, calorie and nutrient-dense foods, and we'll talk about that on the next slide. But things that are, have calories and a small amount, okay? Oftentimes junk food, not always. Um, but candy, okay, candy, chips, fried food, sodas, um, sweet tea, fruit punch, those kinds of things, okay, where you get a lot of calories in a pretty small amount. And then nutrient-dense, um, candy, you know, is kind of similar to the opposite. So something that has a lot of nutrition benefits in the amount it, you're consuming. So fruits and vegetables, whole grains. So whole wheat bread, brown rice, wild rice. Um, rice can be a choking hazard. Of course, you're, you're aware of that, too. Um, so popcorn is a whole grain. Popcorn is a big choking hazard. So that's not something I usually recommend for a person with um, HD. Um, whole wheat pasta, whole wheat whole grain crackers, things like that. Lean, leaner meats, low-fat dairy. Nuts, of course, being careful of, of choking issues. Beans and peas and lentils are a good protein source that are s softer. And then peanut butter, as well as cashew butter, almond butter, all these different other nut butters that are coming out are good protein sources. 
as well as so soy, tofu, and tempeh, too. And um, we all know the, the price of food is going up, too, the, the cost-wise, too. So soy and tofu were much cheaper options, too. So um, so I've, I had a friend cook a meal with tofu recently. I honestly had never cooked it, and it was really, really good. And she told me how cheap it was, so I'm going to really have to get used to it <laughs> to try to save money because I want more shoes. Um, and then ca calorie and nutrient-dense foods. So... So these are things to really concentrate on. So for, so this is kind of what I spend a lot of time with our HD patients doing. So, so every time you, a person with HD eats, I want them to get things that have a lot of calories and a lot of nutrients most of the time, okay? You know, I want them to also get pleasure from eating. I don't want eating to be a job. So how many of you, every time you eat, you sit there and think, okay, does this have a, the right nutrients and the right calories? Am I eating the, on the right kind of plate and using the right kind? You don't do that. You just eat because you want to eat and you're hungry and it looks good and it tastes good, hopefully. So, so think about, so, you know, have some sympathy for the individual with HD has all these things that they're having to deal with too, in addition to those external factors of I'm going to be the last one to finish, that kind of thing. So, so try, to, try to think of those things too. So nuts, nuts, of course, are a choking hazard. They, can, they have what's called nut meal. Has anybody ever heard of that? It's, it's ground up nuts, basically. So, um, so you can, some of the um, supermarkets, grocery stores, you can get what's called nut meal, which is finely ground nuts. And you can use it on just about anything, too. Put it on ice cream and casseroles and cereal. It's a good, it would obviously be a good protein source. Um, avocado. Avocado has a lot of nutrients, but it's got a lot of calories in it, too. So that would be a, a great, great option for many people. It's also soft. So avocados are in season now in most areas, so really take advantage of that, too. So fruit. Any kind of fruit. You can add sugar or any kind of sauces, honey, syrup, things like that, too. Dried fruits, again, can be a choking hazard. So raisins, dried cranberries, dried pineapple, dried papayas, things like that, too. Um, and then juices. So for an individual with Huntington's, one of the things, first things I recommend is if they're losing weight or if they need to gain weight, one of the first things I'll ask them is what they drink. And if they say water, I'll say stop it immediately. You need to drink. If you need to gain weight, you need to cut out water. I want you to drink juice or milk or something with calories in it, okay? Those of y'all that are providers, if you don't remember anything, that's one big thing. So drink things with calories, okay? If you need to lose weight, water, okay? Remember that. Whenever somebody wants to lose weight, you always say, well, drink more water. We don't want an HD patient to lose weight normally, so we want them to drink other things. Now, if they enjoy water, if they say, well, you know what? I really like the taste of water, I'm going to say, okay, have a little bit less of it. You're going to get the same nutrient, um, the liquid benefit, the fluid benefit from the juice or the milk or the fruit punch even. Um, plus, you're going to get some calories from it to help you um, get, more, get more of that benefit. Cook your vegetables in olive oil, okay? So my significant other is here with me, and he's, he's very thin. And, and whenever he cooks at home, he, like, drizzles everything in olive oil. And I'm always like, oh, stop. You know, I, I can't afford a new wardrobe. I gain weight easy. <laughs> okay. So think of that. Okay. Think of David and I. He needs, he needs the calories. I don't. So, so I want you to think of that with your HD patients, too. Add some olive oil to them. Okay. Um, lots of olive oil is good for you. Um, Vienna sausages, those of y'all that are from up north, you may not know what those are. Everybody in Alabama eats those. <laughs> but those are little, um, and they call them, um, they make them for babies now, actually. They're called meat sticks, but they're, they come in a little can, um, and they're full of sodium and a lot of process, but they're very soft, too. And they, um, they come in a little can, a, a little bit the so bigger than the size of the deviled ham or deviled turkey, a little bit bigger than a tuna can, and they're um, called Vienna sausages. They're portable, so you can take them on a plane or camping or whatever. They're very soft. You get a little bit of protein from them, but there's something soft. If you do have a choking issue, you could probably eat them too. 
Um, I can't believe I'm a dietitian and recommending those, but those, <laughs> those are, you know, pretty good. Um, same with fish sticks and chicken nuggets, okay? Fish sticks, I think we all know what those are. Um, so, but they have breading on them. Breading is a, a choking hazard, but you can make some fish yourself, you know, or take the, the coating off. Dip it in sauces or gravies. Same with chicken. You can cut up chicken off the bone and, you know, bake it yourself, you know, with it, and then um, maybe marinate it, too, so it's a little bit softer, those kinds of things, too. Um, usually, the um, if you like chicken or turkey, the dark meat is a little bit softer. It's got a little more fat. Um, but again, that's one of those things. If the person with HD loves the white meat chicken, I want them to eat the white meat chicken, okay? Um, <laughs> same with the chicken nuggets, chicken patties. Lots of ketchup, lots of sauces, lots of gravies on things, too. Um, but lean meats with oil. So if you're baking your own fish, add some extra oil to it, okay? If, if they like shrimp, you know, make some shrimp scampi with lots of butter and oil in it, things like that, too. Um, and then whole grain noodles and breads, those can be a choking hazard. So work closely with your speech therapist. I hear Karen telling our patients lots of sauces and gravies to those things, too. Um, and they even make some made with beans now, too. I, don't, I think those have a little bit of protein, not a whole lot, too. And there is a myth. Um, I don't really have it in the slides, but some people think if they need to gain weight, they need to eat lots of protein, and that's not true, okay? They do need extra calories. They need probably a little more protein, but don't start, you know, people think, oh, I need to eat lots of protein to gain weight, and that's not true. Just calories sometimes, too. Um, and then blend your fruit. You know, hopefully um, you can get a blender or a milkshake maker or something, too. Um, if your berries are going bad, put them in a blender, okay? If your bananas are getting softer, put them in a blender with some other things, too. You know, and it's, there's no one thing that's perfect, just whatever you want to put in them, too. Um, overcooked vegetables, kind of that southern way of cooking vegetables, sometimes makes them softer, too. Lots of oil. Ideally, in the south, if you're from up north, in the south, we cook a lot of our vegetables with ham hock and fat back and salt pork, um, if you know what those things are. I'm not going to go into detail, but you can Google them. But, but it's what makes our vegetables taste good. Honestly, um, of course it, it. But and we overcook our vegetables in the south. So kind of, kind of doing that ideally with more olive oil, canola oil, those heart healthy oils mostly. And then whole milk. Don't drink fat free or low fat milk. They need whole milk too. Um, potato wedges. Again, you can make those homemade. Um, you know, a bag of potatoes. You can microwave them and then dip them in ketchup or sauce or marinade too. Sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes, you can get the canned ones, but you, and you can also bake them. You know, we all know what sweet potato casserole is. That would be another good thing to add that nut meal to, or maybe even potatoes, too. You could, on those fries, the, um, microwave and potatoes, you could sprinkle some of that nut meal on them, too, for some protein. Baked fruits. Baked apples, baked pears. Those would be really soft, too. You could kind of make your own homemade applesauce also. Um, and add some extra butter, sugar, brown sugar, honey, things like that, whatever you want to do to kind of sweeten it, too. Um, sugar's not bad. Sugar is natural. Some people think, well, sugar's bad. And sugar's got a lot of calories. So if, for somebody I want to gain weight, I do want them to have more sugar, okay? Sugar doesn't, isn't going to cause any problems with the HD, too. There's a lot of myths out there that sugar's toxic or, or addictive or something else, and that's crazy. There's not, there's no 12-step programs for sugar, okay? <laughs> so, um, an excess thirst and hunger. So, sometimes um, this can be a nutrition issue. It can sometimes be an obsession issue. So, kind of, you know, or sometimes both, too. So, distraction. Think if you've ever been around little kids when they're doing something they shouldn't be, besides telling them no, you oftentimes have to distract them. Say, let's go watch Barney, or let's go outside and play. Or So think of that, too. We, we do that with ourselves, too. I tell, I tell my patients with diabetes this, too, when they sit, when kind of eating is that habit for them. So I say, okay, distract yourself, and in 15 minutes, if you're still hungry, then have it. 
Okay, same kind of thing with a Huntington's patient too. Maybe don't go into detail, but just say, okay, lunch is over. You know, if you're still hungry, let's go, you know, we've got to go do this right now. And then we'll come back to that. And maybe you can kind of distract them and don't not remind them too. Um, high fiber food. So this is something too, sometimes that the higher fiber foods are going to kind of keep them full, promote what we call satiety. So kind of keep, keep you full a little bit longer. Um, so think of like vegetables, carrots, okay? You can eat chips, potato chips and candy you can eat too much of because there's no fiber to keep you full. But vegetables, fruits, things like that um, are going to fill you up with a little bit less. So maybe there'll, there'll be less of an issue with that. Have standard meal times. I think of my grandmother. Lunch was every day at 12 noon, no matter what else in the world was going on, okay? So maybe setting that for your, your as a caregiver for somebody with HD too. So breakfast is always this time, lunch is always this time, and dinner is always this time. And maybe if, if you wanna have snacks at that same time, and then get them a digital watch so they can see it's 2.15, snack time's at 2.30, kind of, and remind them too. Activity before meals, just to help deal with anxiety and depression, if possible. You know, you know sometimes there are limitations for that, but some kind of activity before meals to help. And snacks between meals. Snacks aren't necessarily a bad thing, but try to think of something that could be quick. So those applesauce packets, maybe, or a milkshake, or, you know, something small, too. Um, they, could, they could fix themselves, too. So medication um, side effects, sometimes um, if, if an individual has diarrhea is an issue we talk about a lot with nutrition. Um, I don't hear about it a whole lot with the, the HD sometimes, but of course extra fluids is needed with that too. So if they're on a thick and liquid regimen, you're going to need to get a little more juice or a little more fruit punch or a little more sweet tea for them to allow for that too. Um, if they're having constipation, sometimes moving more just to help with the gravity of things too. So move around a little more to help with the constipation. Sometimes it's gonna occur anyway too. So plenty of fiber, it may seem kind of the opposite of what's needed, but, um, but plenty of fiber and fluids too. And then act, the physical activity, again, within your limitations. Weight or taste changes can sometimes occur with medications too. I don't hear about the taste changes as much with the HD meds. Sometimes that can occur. So um, with that, I would say talk to your neuro provider. Um, potentially, sometimes as providers, there might be an al alternative medication too. Um, and then nausea, stomach upset, ginger tends to help with that too. So there's ginger tea. Um, again, add sugar, honey, something to that to give them calories. Ginger snaps are kind of hard, um, but you know, or you can cook with ginger, of course, too. Um, saltine or soda crackers, eat a little more frequently. Um, for some people, carbonated drinks or teas um, help them too. So, um, so but with the nausea too. So, so sometimes if you go too long without eating, you can get that nausea too. So sometimes encouraging them to have ha eat a little more frequently. There are prescriptions for nausea. Um, many of them out there as well too. So ask for that from the provider if you need that. So dentures and missing teeth. So um, it, I didn't learn this till just a few years ago, um, but as little as a 10 pound weight change can affect how dentures fit. So, um, so that's, that's something to, to keep in mind too. Um, Medicare and a lot of insurances only cover one or two sets of dentures in a lifetime too. So, so always keep that in mind too. Um, so with, with dentures or missing teeth, and, den and this will be an issue, um, we have a lot of individuals with, with HD that have um, unfortunately been into drugs, and we've all heard of people with uh, what they call meth mouth, or um, become meth or other um, drugs, and then it affects their oral cavity. So teeth is a big nutrition issue. So if you, if you can't chew things, that, that becomes an issue. So think of ground beef type texture foods. So you can get ground beef, ground pork, ground turkey, whatever you want to get, add some sauces and stuff to it. That tuna, ham, chicken salad, egg salad, pimento cheese, that kind of stuff. Um, those, those Vienna sausages again. Um, eggs, you can do eggs in a number of ways. Eggs are an excellent protein source. 
to. Um, so eggs can be added to things. Of course, avoid raw eggs, too. Those are a risk, too. Tofu, tempeh, beans, hummus. Um, and then those soft, overcooked vegetables, sometimes bananas, canned fruits, um, canned pears, peaches, things like that. Those applesauce pouches you can find on the, um, the fruit aisles at grocery stores, yogurt, ice cream, puddings, things like that, too, um, are kind of some, some ways to get... Um, when somebody is missing teeth or dentures, adequate and, and safe protein sources are always a big concern, too. So um, we're not talking a whole lot about nutrition support. This is my only slide on this, but a PEG tube is a percutaneous gastrostomy tube is what it stands for. Um, so this is something if you are in early stages or mid stages of HD, I do recommend telling your, your caregivers or your loved ones and family and your provider what your wishes are as the disease progresses. Um, but, but you can do a, what's called a PEG tube. Um, insurance and Medicare and oftentimes Medicaid will cover the placement of a PEG tube. This is a, a picture of one. Um, but coverage sometimes, in, like in Alabama, um, Medicare will cover a PEG tube, place the procedure of placing a PEG tube, which is an outpatient procedure. You just go to the doctor like you're getting any other test, and you go home usually the same day. Um, and you can start using the tube within eight hours. But in Alabama, oftentimes Medicare won't cover the formula that needs to be delivered via the PEG tube if the person can eat. Okay? So... So bear in mind that. So I've heard of a lot of stories about that. The doctor will place the PEG tube, but then the formula you have to pay out of pocket for, and that becomes a big, huge, that's a huge expense. So, um, so always check with your, work with your social worker if you're thinking about getting one of those. So this person is getting um, what we call a, does this work? So this is, this is where the tube is placed in the stomach, okay? And then there's a button um, where, the, where that yellow section is next to the stomach. There's a, a button, and so you could disconnect this, what looks, what's called a catheter. You disconnect that after the formula. This person is getting what we call a bolus feeding, okay? So two to four times a day, they get some formula delivered the, via that, okay? And then you can also get what's called a pump or an IV pole where you put the formula in a bag, kind of like a regular IV, if you've ever had an IV, um, and it goes overnight usually is usually what we do so that the person can move around during the day or wh whenever they're sleeping. Some people think bolus is better, and that's not necessarily so. Um, it usually just depends on preference, too. And again, it's not for whole food. I can't tell you how many horror stories I've heard about people trying to grind up their steak and lobster and push it in there. That's, that's a huge, I mean, safety risk as well as other, other risk too. So um, make sure your, your wishes are known for that. Contact your provider too. Um, and so supplements, so vitamin, mineral supplements. So these are not usually recommended um, unless you've been advised by a medical team too. So supplements, a good vitamin mineral supplement, a really good one, um, about one to two percent of it is absorbed. Okay, so um, the supplement industry will lead you to believe all the opposite, but that's the, what this, the research and the science shows. Okay, um, you know they're good. They're good insurance, but just like you know, I have homeowners insurance, but I'm not going to burn my house down to see what happens. Okay. <laughs> So, um, so you can't eat candy and rely on a supplement, okay? Brand name shakes puddings, Ensure Boost, um, what used to be called Carnation Instant Breakfast, as I think called Carnation Breakfast Essentials now, those are expensive if you've ever gotten them, too. They are good kind of portable type things, too. If, if the person likes those, great, but there's no magic bullet that those are better than anything else. They do have a lot of nutrients. They probably are calorie and nutrient dense, but there's many other things too that are just as good. They are portable if you like them. You know, there's tons of different kinds. There's, you know, you can buy some at the health food store or the grocery store. 
Um, even Slim Fast is kind of the same kind of premise, even though that's promoted for weight loss, it's kind of the same idea too. But if you like those, you know, they're fine. Just I, I am aware they are pretty expensive. Again, back to the homemade supplements, okay? Usually we do want you to have some kind of protein in them, okay? And that could be, you know, steak and lobster if you want to put it in the blender and see what happens. I've never seen it or tried it, but, you know, maybe, maybe so. Um, but nut butter, so that peanut butter, almond butter, cashew butter, something like that, or that nut meal we talked about. Some kind of milk, yogurt, ice cream if you want that. Um, if the person is lactose intolerant, maybe that's not a good option. Um, chia seeds or flaxseed meal, or um, if you've heard of those, those are um, oftentimes found in the baked goods sections at the grocery store too. And those are um, have a little bit of protein in them too if you wanna add those to things too. Um, and then protein powders, various protein powders you can get. Again, don't spend a fortune. There's none better than any other. So as far as the HD goes. And then sometimes add a sweetener or a flavor. So again, sugar, honey, corn syrup, um, something like that too, to, to give it calories plus flavor. So this is about the, the various types of supplements. So, um, so these are, um, so this is some research. I do try to follow the research for Huntington's um, too on, in supplements. There's lots of data out there, but there's nothing conclusive. So there's unknown benefits um, for the symptoms of, of Huntington's, but the, and none of them cure the Huntington's, obviously. Um, I think if they did, we would, we would, hear, we would have heard about it this morning. But kind of like the doctors were talking this morning in the opening session, um, it's hard. Some of these supplements, they're, they're given large doses, and the large doses, at one point, you're getting large doses, and then at what point is it harmful or beneficial? And nobody really knows, too. So that's the problem, too. But polyphenols is a kind of a general term for antioxidants. Acetylcarnitine, CoQ10, omega-3 is what you get from seafood. There is some data showing that, that omega-3 may be beneficial for Huntington's. And omega-3 is seafood, nuts, that olive oil, canola oil, um, and, um, and then that chia seed, flax seed too. Resveratrol is what you get from grapes and grape juice. Green tea, um, curcumin is another one, milk thistle, and ginkgo. So again, this is a direct quote from that research study. The availability of these substances to the central nervous system in large amounts to be beneficial without harm is unknown. So personally, I, as a healthcare provider, um, for a person with HD, I would just say save your money, okay? I'd much rather you spend your money on, on healthy foods too. And again, another study said supplements are no beneficial effect on the Huntington's disease rating score. So um, there's, there's lots of data on them, but there's not really good conclusive data. Um, Hesperidin is a um, supplement you can Google. I Googled it last night. You can buy a bottle from anywhere from $5 to $30. Um, it's a dietary supplement. In cell and animal studies, not humans, it may improve brain, blood flow, and memory. So in reading that, I just want to kind of just tell you a sidebar story. In the nutrition world, there was a study um, I think it was in the 90s, I'm not sure, don't quote me on that, where they found they, um, antioxidants. There was, it was a large study involved lots of people, not with HD, just general people with, um, and they thought, well, we'll start giving these people antioxidant-rich vitamins. Vitamin A is an antioxidant, vitamin C. And after about a year, they stopped the vitamin, this, the research, because the people that were taking the vitamin A had higher rates of cancer. So that's an example of just because it's antioxidant, you think, oh, it can't hurt you. Potentially it could. So, and that's, so I just like to tell that story just to, as an example, be careful. Okay. Um, and then um, <clears throat> another example of a supplement that can cause harm that's kind of new is zinc. A lot of us heard about zinc during um, the COVID pandemic. Many people and many of my patients still with diabetes are still taking zinc supplements. 
okay? Zinc supplements actually can cause copper deficiency. So the signs of copper deficiency are very similar to Huntington's chorea, okay? So if, if you've been told to take zinc supplements or if you're taking zinc supplements, um, sometimes people are recommended to take them. They do help with wound healing, but we always say stop taking them. Don't take them more than three weeks at a time. Stop it for a week and then resume it. So if you are one of those individuals taking zinc and you feel like it helps you, okay, but you need to stop it at least one week per month to prevent copper deficiency. And that's for everybody. Um, so these are other sources, um, and the, the notes will be online, I heard this morning. And just in summary, eat many nutrient-dense foods, okay? If the president gave me the, the panel for a minute, that's what I'd say for everybody, <laughs> okay? Everybody, not just the person with, new, with Huntington's. Avoid weight loss for Huntington's unless you've been advised to, okay? In fact, gain a little bit of weight. Avoid or limit stimulants. Caffeine, alcohol, tobacco, okay? Um, work closely with your neurologist and your care team, okay? And never start any supplement, vitamin, mineral, protein powder. Well, protein powder, is not they're not gonna usually cause any harm unless you've been told to by your medical team. Okay, thank you all. That's it. Anybody here have any questions? Yeah. Um, I think I've, I've got it. Um, somebody says their husband has three boosts a day in addition to meals. That's not too many vitamins. Um, yeah, the, the boost in insure stuff, you can have um, those kinds of things. When I was mentioning this, the harm of supplements, I mean individual vitamin supplements like you buy at the pharmacy the grocery store. So the Boost Insure Carnation type things, those, those aren't going to have too high a doses. Recommended water intake, um, that would vary by the person. Um, usually um, we say, you, you know, the six to eight cups isn't always the standard. Um, we usually, you know, I would say talk to your provider or ask for a referral to a dietitian. What is G water? Um, I'm not sure what that individual means, if you can respond to them. Um, maybe grams, well, grams water. Um, oh, okay, oh, okay, so they just hit enter too fast like I do. <laughs> and then what are the calorie requirements for mid-disease? Um, so that person says their, their BMI is 24, so I would say maybe get it, their BMI or body mass index up to 27. Um, and the calorie requirements um, are a little bit higher for, for individuals with HD. There is some data showing that um, individuals with HD probably have a higher metabolic rate besides having the chorea. Of course, chorea is movement we're all aware of, so their, their calorie needs are going to be a little bit higher with that. So I would say for a person with a body mass index of 24, work on getting it maybe up to 27 if you could, 27, 28, something like that, unless you've been told otherwise. Um, let me see. Um, so, uh, um, some, and then another person, a healthy BMI for HD patients, if they have to be slightly overweight, I would say 26 to 28 for a healthy BMI, at least. Um, we have a problem with random sugar drops if we don't watch our diet, and doctors have, been, have done testing, no evidence related to a diabetes. That sounds like, um, excuse me, the glucose drop um, sounds like what, what would be the condition called hypoglycemia as a diagnosis, not related to diabetes. But for that individual, yeah, they should eat every um, two to three hours would be the goal with that for somebody with that condition. Some, it's, it happens sometimes, it's not very common, but some people have what they call hypoglycemia, which is where they do potentially pass out if they don't eat something every two to three hours. So their, blood sugar, their body's not able to maintain a healthy blood sugar. So um, it's, you know, the, the risk of passing out is the risk of falls and harming yourself, but that, I don't see that with, I, I don't think I've ever seen that with Huntington's. Um, I would 
that, and that's good your doctor said that, but it sounds like that person just has um, Huntington's and hypoglycemia. So that would be very, very important to eat every two to three hours and then fiber-rich foods too to help with that. Um, any questions here in the audience? Oh, okay. Uh, is it toward the top? Okay. Um, do individuals with HD need all the extra calories because of the chorea? Absolutely, because the chorea is movement. Um, like, think of it like physical activity. So they are going to need those extra calories to prevent weight loss too and prevent malnutrition as well. Yes, ma'am. Um, I, I can't really just because it's, um, you know, you could probably go online and Google that too. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that the dietary guidelines are based on 2,000 calories for a person too. Um, but I think with the, the Huntington's and the Korea especially, I think maybe – not necessarily, and don't, don't make it a number per se. Like sometimes I tell patients that need to gain weight or even lose weight. I don't give them a number to concentrate on because I think it's going to vary based on the person too. So I think just try to eat more often till you get to that point where weight loss stops too. And hopefully the chorea is controlled too. I see the Osteto really helping sometimes with the patients with the chorea too. So, um, but I think just, you know, trying to eat a little more to get to the point where the weight loss stops or the weight maintenance starts. Okay, something like that. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Okay, so, so um, a, a, a man asked about vitamins and multivitamin. Yeah, the multivitamin is still going to have about 1% absorption. And a general multivitamin is, is safe. They don't usually put mega doses of anything in that, so that should be fine. Just a general, you know, if you want to take a vitamin, I think that just a general multivitamin is usually what's recommended. What about like, like, and like vitamin C is, you know, it has a pretty high amount of, uh, I know a lot of it's, you're only going to retain, what, maybe 1% of that as well? And they come in so many high doses in that. Yeah, yeah, that, you know, the, the research I've, I've looked at is that 1% generally, I haven't looked at individual. So, um, you know, vitamin C is, um, a lot of people were taking large doses of that. And there is, um, just in the nutrition world, there is questions about maybe the RDA, recommended dietary allowance for vitamin C is a little bit low. We probably need more, more of that. But again, most of us need to eat more fruits and vegetables, which is the best absorption. So I think, you know, potentially extra vitamin C is probably okay. I don't want to put a number on it, but the risk of too much vitamin C is also... Too much vitamin C can cause diarrhea, kind of cold, runny nose-like symptoms, too. So that's an example of what's, mm -hmm. been, what's the point at which it's beneficial or harmful, too. So. And then you get into, like, vitamin D. <laughs> yeah, that? vitamin D, a lot of people are taking, too. Um, vitamin D deficiency is becoming pretty, pretty right. common, prevalent. Um, worldwide, or I don't know about worldwide, but in the U.S. especially. So, um, so a lot of people take vitamin D too. Um, but again, that's one of those never start taking unless your provider's told you you are deficient too. So a multivitamin will have all those in them without too much of them. The risk comes when you start going to the pharmacy and say, okay, I'm going to take vitamin A and vitamin B1 and vitamin B2 and vitamin B3 and then vitamin B6 and you have a grocery cart full of all these vitamins, that's where the risk comes in. Just a general multivitamin and maybe an additional, if your doctor's told you to take an additional one, I think is fine. So it's safe enough just to take the, uh, the multivitamins and the dosage and that. Yeah, and yes. That. Yeah, that's safe, definitely. You know, unless, unless you take like B12 if you need it. If you're yeah, you are B12 if, yeah, if you need to also. What, what about these, these supplements of like Gilbo and things like that? You know, yeah, that's the one that, you know, those are going to be potentially, right. you know, potentially you're just paying for extra, you know, extra something that may or may not 
have some benefit or not too. So, and the supplement industry, I don't know if y'all are aware in the U S is not regulated. So if, so any, any, any prescription you get is regulated, but in the U S you could go home and buy some capsules online and say they're whatever you wanted them to be and sell them. And it's perfectly legal. So, um, you know, I generally in the science community, the idea is that as a supplement company is not going to risk their reputation. Um, but, but that is, there's no law regulating supplements too. Okay. So I don't know if I had a, just one other question outside. You did only mention fish so much. I know the you know the omega three is, is high in the, mm-hmm. you know in salmon and, and things like that. It, a lot of the you know you mentioned like chicken and things like that, but fish has a uh, a lot of benefits. You know, with, you know. With mm-hmm. Yeah, fish and seafood do have a lot of benefits too. Right. Mm-hmm. And the risk of mercury poisoning is very 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 low ah. from from seafood too. Um, avoid the higher mercury fish, which are shark, swordfish, tilefish, king mackerel, and then um, whatever. If you consume fish from your local waters, you need to look up the re- the guidelines from that. But usually, the benefits of the omega three in the seafood are much much higher than the small risk of mercury. Thank you. Thank you. And um, he said there's some streaming questions. I guess. Uh huh. Um, I didn't, do you recommend like the Mediterranean diet or any of these diets that require, you know, like non fruits a day or veg? Is there any reason? Um, there, you know, there's some data on the Mediterranean diet. Um, a lot of that, those, those statements I read were, were studies done on the Mediterranean diet as well. Um, it potentially may or may not be beneficial. The Mediterranean diet is, is expensive too. So for, for a lot of individuals with HD, I recognize. Um, they're they're on disability and sometimes finances are a limit. But but yeah, you know, plenty of fruits and vegetables is always going to be beneficial for everybody because of the natural antioxidants you're going to get. But is there anything that you recommend today? Like I think they say nine, nine a day. Um, I usually recommend at least two to four cups of fruits and vegetables per day for the most Americans too. Most of us need at least that minimum two cups. And somebody asked to repeat the audience question online. It was questions about various vitamins and minerals, um, vitamin D, vitamin C, B12, and um, ginkgo. And the, the, basically the idea is that um, you run the risk of getting too much when you start taking individual vitamins. Never start taking them unless your provider has told you to. Too much protein could cause diarrhea. Not that I've heard. I mean, potentially, maybe depending on what the source of the protein was. Um, but um, but but diarrhea can also be caused by t- a concentrated, too concentrated of things too. So um, people after weight loss or bariatric surgery that can get diarrhea if they consume too concentrate things that are t- kind of too much for their system. So that potentially might be a risk. Might. That's the only instance I could think of where the protein would cause that. Would you recommend fruits and vegetables for sources of vitamins and minerals over supplements? Yes, regardless of who you are. I will always recommend fruits and vegetables as sources of nutrients over supplements for 100% of the population. So in, the, you know, in, in absorbing, you know, with, the, you know, with fiber and everything and you know, in absorption, with the fruits and vegetables, you know, you, you mentioned more cooked than, than raw. You said raw could cause problems with, you know, with choking. But you get, um, you cook out a lot of the, uh, of the nutrients. You can't, there, there is some data showing that if you overcook the vegetables, you potentially could cook out some of the nutrients. There's also some data showing that if you cook them a little bit, you also get, um, it kind of helps absorb some of the nutrients too. So it just, it, you know. However, you can get your vegetables in, ideally. And if you, you know, if you're cooking the vegetables in water or oil, maybe subsequently save that to make a soup or, or sauce or gravy with it too. There was a question that was a question about if you overcook the vegetables, do you ever do you cook out the nutrients? Um, may or you know, if you overcook them, probably a little bit, but just save the the fluid or the oil or whatever for to use with something else, maybe. 
Any other questions? Could blending produce decrease their benefits online? Um, no, I would say not. Um, I think I've read a couple of studies showing it actually might help get some of the benefits there too. And yes, sir. I, uh, I have a question about um, frequency of, mm -hmm. of, of eating. Um, mm -hmm. My mother has, she's in the mid stage of, of Huntington and I think she's having increasing hard, hard time to kind of sit down and keep, you know, eating and just taking that time. Mm -hmm. um, she's been kind of increasingly complaining about how much food she has on her plate, even though it's like a normal amount. So we've been trying to um, kind of distribute um, the, the meal by like two, and they, you know, uh, let her eat around six and also around like nine or 10. Um, and I just wanted to ask you if there's any red flags or even pros and cons of, of providing her four meals or five meals instead of three meals per day. Um, yeah, those of y'all online, his question was um, his, his caregiver, her, his family member with HD um, doesn't w like to eat much when it's meal time, and is it harmful or beneficial to eat smaller, more frequent meals? There's, there's no risk. I think it's, it's great, and you've, you've worked on a way to do that. Um, a lot of times, I haven't seen this with HD, but I have seen it with, with other um, elderly individuals, that when, when, when you want somebody to gain weight, kind of the, kind of the instinctual thing is, oh, well, I'm going to load up their plate with 1,000 calories and lots of food, and maybe if they just take two or three bites, that gets really overwhelming to people. So maybe doing smaller amounts. And, you know, and think of ways to make them feel good about themselves, too. So to have that positive feedback. So, so like you just said, she, she, she doesn't like to eat much. So she's, I'm assuming, and this may be my wrong assumption, that she's used to you saying, no, no, Mom, eat some more, eat some more, eat some more. What if you kind of do a little bit less and where she eats 100% of it, so you can say, oh my gosh, that's great, mom. Thanks so much, I'm so glad you ate. So she kind of walks away kind of feeling proud of herself. You know, as a brain condition, I don't, I don't know if that's a legitimate assumption but on my part or not. Should I be concerned about how late she eats? So, uh, or, so it's two questions. Um, one about if I do distribute the frequency, like is there a difference in nutrient intakes? And two, if I do like give her, um, pretty late at night, so around like 11 o'clock maybe, you know, uh, a decent amount of food, and then let, you know, if, if she sleeps around 12, would, would that affect her health, her nutrient intake, um, her, her calorie intake? Um, the other question was if she eats too late, is it harmful? No, no. Okay. And there's, you know, you may hear about that in the weight loss world too, that eating late's bad, and that's not, it's, it's just your total calorie intake for the day, it seems to. There is some, some data about the, what they call time-restricted eating or fasting, that it may help some markers of like glucose or lipids or cholesterol or something, but I think the HD is the more pressing concern in that case, and I think definitely, and there's, and there's that's still kind of preliminary data on that fasting or time-restricted eating as well, too. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then anonymous, would eating a snack later at night help to increase calories daily? Absolutely, too. You know, ways to get more, think of any, any option to get more calories in. I don't care what time of day. You know, if the person doesn't sleep, it, sleep well at night, you know, maybe, you know, if they, if they um, don't wake them up to eat, but maybe if, you know, having a snack every time they're, they're awake or something, too. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you all so much. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And special thanks to Roche and, or not Roche, excuse me, um, Broda and Sage for sponsoring this talk. I appreciate their support.